Upon the twentieth moon of the year of the Shining Cloud, a horseman rode through the village of Idian Glen to warn its people that the terrible dragon Nin had risen beneath Chrysia. It would be no more than two tides before he came upon them, forced through their fields by an accidental geographical cruelty, the narrowing of the rivers Islia and Skywine. Because so many of the king's men were needed in the north to fight off the Arctican advance, the villagers were told to flee over the Light Pass Mountains, where temporary shelters could be constructed for them. King Rudiger had asked the horsemen for an estimate of how many of the people of Idian Glen intended to remain on their farms, so that he could know if any of the Sagittarian Guard should detach for a purely defensive countermeasure. To his dismay, Absolutely no one claimed to wish to leave despite the danger. The residing consul then risked offending the king by refusing to provide an accurate count of the citizenry. That would be a foolish errand, he wrote. In the face of a threat such as this, no one can say what our strength truly is. When the fire does become real, even the weakest child will pick up a stone, and the most debilitated man might find himself fighting with the power of three. During my first weekend at Causeway Recovery House in Candless, the proud seat of rural Nampa County, a friendly administrator by the name of Barrett Boyle decided to drop an atomic bomb on me. Each and every Sunday, he explained, there were car rides available to take me wherever I wished to go for the afternoon, provided as a cheerful service by a rotating gaggle of local volunteers who had apparently never heard of the National Football League. Now, I loved Barrett already. Barrett was an older black guy with a prim white beard and a disposition that was half body pillow, half cup of chamomile tea with extra honey. The words that came out of Barrett's mouth didn't just inform you. They wrapped you up in a duck feather coat and pinned woolen mittens to it. He wanted not only you to be happy, he wanted the lamp behind you to be happy. He even wanted the outer asteroid belt of Orion to be happy. Behind bifocals the size of snow tires lived a church-going gaze of such warmth that I sometimes pondered drying my socks with it. He wasn't a therapist, just a paper pusher who'd gotten the job 18 years before straight out of a gig with the ASPCA. I signed on with the scheme Barrett described immediately. Candless was 61 miles outside of the city, and because you weren't allowed to have a car at Causeway, no matter what level your boutique depression treatment, when you got off the train and were dumped at the door by the Spanish shuttle driver, you basically became Jonathan Harker, trapped inside the walls of Castle Dracula and slipping a few pieces of silver to the local gypsies now and then to deliver your desperate letters for help. Barrett was telling me I could go anywhere I wanted within 30 miles or so, and my daydreams were suddenly filled with boyish visions of bleak frozen cornfields nearly twice the size of the ones that surrounded the Causeway campus in all directions. When I told Barrett I was woefully unfamiliar with Canlis and pretty much all points east, west, and north, he pushed his glasses up on his nose and gave me the highlights if by highlights you meant facts pertaining only to events taking place before 1921, that was where his interest seemed to end. Those British, you know, Barrett said. They really wanted to control Candlas during the Revolution because they could see everything coming from miles from High Street. So what they did is bring in a big Hessen regiment, those German soldiers, see, and they liked it in Candlas so darn much they stayed on after the war and married all the women they could find. And here the babies came, and that was how Candlas went from part German to mostly German. That was how things stayed, until the Irish people came, because of, oh, you know, the potato famine, all coming to America for something to eat. And there was more marrying and having babies, and now the people were Irish, and that's how it stayed. They say... Barrett trailed off, closed his eyes tight, and put a hand on his forehead, enjoying the nice long afternoon pause, the length of which they just don't make in America anymore since the invention of stress. What's that they say, dang it? Ah, if you could lay three Fitzgeralds end to end without hitting a Schneider, you know you've left Candless. I could listen to him all day. 
He had collected all this information from the Historical Society in Magaha. Now let me give you a real hello over here, he said, moving a little arthritically towards his office window. Do you see that brick building on the hill? That was the first public high school for black folks in the state. That was where my grandmother went. She was a relay runner. Now, you tell me I was meant to work anywhere else than right here. Giant grin from Barrett. Then he coaxed the copier in the corner into spitting out a release form for me. Name, Calvin Tarby. Birth date, 4-8-1971. 42 years. Visit start, October 29, 2013. Selected recovery program, Pelican. Contact counselor, Mary Bell. I agree that by leaving the campus, I assume the usual risks of travel and do not hold Causeway or its volunteers liable for accident or injury beyond standard negligence laws. November 7th. My first documented ride occurred in a 1997 Honda Civic painted a color I like to think of as autopsy table gray. It pulled up mumbling to itself beside my spacious bungalow and I met Pete Pagney. Pete had somehow collected so much anger in his 25 years on earth that it seemed to propel the vehicle itself up and down the hills of the Steppentel Turnpike. But it was anger of a funny kind, really. If someone dared to drive a single millisecond below the speed limit, Pete unfurled a colorful banner of old-world Italian curses in his direction, condemning even the victims as yet unborn great-grandchildren to the most undercleaned men's rooms of hell. Pete labeled the Department of Motor Vehicles that had yesterday stuck him for $22 to renew his license as a bunch of monkey face humpers. After I think I had merely asked him if he had enjoyed the pretty leaves of autumn. Pete was driving for Causeway on Sundays at the suggestion of the state court system. He had recently been augmenting his income as a barista by selling weed to several of the white-collar professionals who worked in the building above the bagel joint where he reigned. The way the delivery system worked was this. They would know to ask for an extra cup with their latte or their mochaccino, and conveniently find that it held a few ounces of primo stuff. Pete loved these people because they overpaid and overpaid on schedule. The one time he had strayed outside the yuppie you heard, he accidentally sold something to an undercover policeman at a thievery corporation concert. Now, Pete was looking for a privately owned coffee bar where he could work his shifts alone and continue supplying a dozen members or so of the upper middle class with herbal enlightenment. He had only empathetic words for the judge who had sentenced him to 80 hours of community service, calling her a dyke cockroach. Pete and I commiserated about monkey face humpers we had known until I had to pin down exactly where he was taking me. Sensing that he, like me, was a modern-day Barry Lyndon born for a ribald adventure among the jet set. I pointed at a wrinkled listing in the weekend edition of the Candlest Examiner. By God, we were on our way to the 7th Annual Nampa County Cat Expo. For me, it was simply the place that promised the most human beings per square foot that I could easily access. For Pete, it held the promise of releasing 25 years of pent-up, weapons-grade cat-hating. He was fully down for standing by my side in the face of the Persian menace. He speeded us rather dangerously west, viciously cussing out the members of his fantasy basketball team all the while, when all I'd asked him is if he had joined home-baked bread. Like all truly high-caliber social events, the Cat Expo was being held halfway between a wetlands preserve and a quarry. We parked in a vast expanse of cement nothingness and entered a hangar-like building infused with a smell of cat litter, perspiration, pizza, paint thinner, and bulky sweatshirts. Coincidentally, at the exact same moment when we entered, the only borderline attractive woman in the joint walked out, obviously having stuck her head in only to ask directions to Old Navy. Pete and I shuffled forward into the unknown. One thing became clear very quickly. These particular cat people were not some of the world's great stander-uppers. We moseyed up and down narrow rows of chipped cafeteria tables at which tired-looking folks in sagging lawn chairs didn't typically bother to rise in order to pull the bath towels away from cages revealing the latest in, say, Siamese flame point technology. After getting one look at a furry beast's indifferent yet calculating eyes, 
Down went the towel again, and back to the December issue of People went the owners, who had inevitably driven Kitty in from a farm in a remote town that used to be called one thing, but then along came the fire of 34, and then it was called another thing. The oddest sight of the stroll through this maze of furballs was an elderly Korean war veteran, decorated in full military regalia, sitting beside his cat breeder wife, as if propped in his chair to appeal to that all-important Korean war veteran demographic. The man did not move, did not speak, just sort of looked into some middle space, silently comparing this moment with the time he saved Sergeant Schnetker's elbow during the charge of Hill 241. We weren't twenty minutes into the gala when a godlike voice boomed over a loudspeaker between overtly pro-cat declarations. What came forth was an announcement that seemed to shock no one but me, rendering us suddenly exposed and weaponless on hostile ground. Attention, please, we have an escaped animal on the event floor. Please step carefully. Do not attempt to catch it. I expected people to scatter crazily and stampede accordingly. But while I assumed this was a Mothra-level incursion requiring SWAT team and possibly FEMA involvement, life seemed to go on as normal for those intent on buying the latest high-end scratching posts or kibble shaped like LeBron James. Once assured of our safety... Pete and I became riveted by the judging of the short hair division. A cadaverous man in a peach-colored lab coat picked up feline after feline and submitted them to brutal biological inspection, bending their wee limbs this way and that like a man looking for meat on a steamed crab, then flipping them upside down and examining tiny bits that were surely better left unexamined. It was impossible to humiliate a cat, I guess. The dozen or so people observing this were as rapt with attention as we were. With stone-faced precision, the judge handed off each little gladiator to a plump teenaged assistant who locked them in their cages and quickly affixed a ribbon for third place, sixth place, eighth place, sixteenth place, certificate of attendance, certificate of awareness, successful accomplishment of basic motor function. Every cat got something, like in Cub League T-Ball. The first place winner stared around blankly, probably trying to keep his nerves in check by visualizing the audience dangling from a mobile. I thought the little guy resembled some celebrity I couldn't quite put my finger on. Pete said it was Hannibal Lecter and kept double-fisting Pepsi from the snack bar to augment the mammoth Mountain Dew big gulp he'd had going when he picked me up at ten o'clock. Exhausted a half hour in from the dizzying spectacle around us, we decided to sit at a picnic table near the snack bar and share an enormous tub of popcorn, or, as it appeared on the menu above our heads, P-O-C-O-N. Those missing letters were in a better place now, I was sure. Even a single bite of that crunchy yellow porn was kind of verboten according to Causeway's Pelican program, which put flawless nutrition near the top of its patients' priority lists. By the end of my six weeks, I was supposed to be 100% off junk food. So I was giving myself one last fling with the dark side, before a monastic life revolving entirely around hemp milk and essence of tofurkey. Pete talked a little about what he had planned for the next week or so, while he idly looked for work. He planned to make an enormous pot of pasta arrabbiata, drink himself stupid with Heineken, and play Assassin's Creed Three until the phone rang with a nibble. He was also reading a book about prison tattooing in Russia and how guys there would try to get their entire life story inked into their limbs. We were deep into the topic of why women seemed so unable to grasp the basic engineering principles of good cushion fort construction when the voice of doom once again thundered above us. Attention, please. We have an escaped animal on the expo floor. Please step cautiously. The animal is an orange tabby named Aggie L. And may bite. Please do not attempt to catch it. By now it was becoming obvious that remaining in this cauldron of chaos was reducing our odds of survival with every passing moment, despite how nonchalant our fellow attendees seemed as they sold Garfield dental bibs to the masses. I decided upon further review not to buy anything from the nearby women whose booth displayed stately 19th century portraits of cats in business suits with cable knit sweaters. Any pet done for $300. Then we fled to safety. On the drive back, Pete asked me what I did for a living. I told him that until a few months ago I had been a highfalutin data analyst for a major firm of so-and-sos in the big city, which had afforded me with the green to pay off a leisurely live-in stretch at Causeway. But I was more than willing now to help him sell pot brownies out of a backpack on the streets of San Jose. Yeah, 
I wore a suit and a tie once to an interview, he told me. Anybody ever tries to get me to do that again, I'll drink the blood out of their lungs. He was quite curious about the mysterious goings-on inside Causeway's walls and whether he should be shifting his hunt for a wife more in the direction of the hot yet emotionally damaged. He dropped me off at my room and said he'd see me around. If I wanted, he could show me some time how to roll my own cigarettes, which he did to relax. I'd never smoked in my life, but if Pete Bagney said this was a good thing, it was a good thing. I imagined us sitting in his apartment, overlooking an overflowing dumpster with blinds drawn, whiling away an afternoon blizzard listening to Marillion. Yeah, I was 17 years older than he was. Smoking home-rolled cigs and engaged in a pixelated life-and-death struggle to beat him in some video game involving cyborg hockey players wielding shoulder-mounted cobras. Sign me up. November 14th. The next Sunday was gray and drizzly, and I was a little nervous because the examiner had failed to reveal to me the sort of impending titanic cultural benchmark that Pete and I had experienced the week before. So I decided that if my new driver didn't reveal any concierge-level information on interesting doings within Causeway's suggested radius, I would go for a hike. Though... Go for a hike was just four completely self-explanatory syllables. I wasn't exactly sure how that was done, nor where or what was expected of me by any governing bodies that might oversee such operations. I was a city lad, you know. Plus, I would already be familiar with everyone on this alleged hike, namely me, who tended to drone on and on about boring topics I was barely familiar with. Things turned out most awesomely, though. There was not just someone behind the wheel of the cozy Lincoln Town car that picked me up. There was a whole extra humanoid in the back seat. Davis and Carolyn Herman were retirees living in Biddeford who were active in their church like sugar was active in Fruit Loops. They were out and about every day of the week, saving the world with a smile. I talked mostly with Davis since Carolyn was hard of hearing and seemed to be perfectly happy grinning occasionally in the back seat, chiming in once in a while when there was something pleasant to say. The physical size discrepancy between the two of them was almost science fiction-y. Carolyn was so petite, I was worried she might fall between the seat cushions and need to be fished out with a coat hanger. When Davis, who'd assembled boats for fifty years and was fairly glad to be shut of it, asked me where I wanted to go, I rolled the dice and asked them what was on their schedule. It turned out part of their weekend routine was giving rides to released prisoners up at Dighton, and they had a trip scheduled that very afternoon if I wanted to come along. Afternoon solved. Since I had no tantalizing place to be in the interim, Davis and Carolyn invited me to lunch with their friends. Every Saturday and Sunday, the denizens of the assisted living facility in Biddeford hijacked a corner of the Roy Rogers off Route 6 from 8 in the morning till about 2 in the afternoon, having no particular agenda or plan. It was just an ongoing organic act of terror. When we got there at ten, the seniors had the place jumping. Almost twenty of them were spread out cozily, pounding down decaf and finishing mop-up operations on innumerable egg and cheese sandwiches. Davis introduced me as a friend from the city. You survived, two different cotton tops said simultaneously. I sat beside an old man in a John Deere windbreaker, whose entire interaction with his coffee consisted of blowing on it every thirty seconds. Never sipped it once. Instead of finding me a fascinating curiosity, the gang immediately ignored me to get to discussing the pressing issue of the day, which was poor Art. Art was the manager of Roy Rogers, a pudgy, balding fellow who was at this moment trapped in a far corner of the joint, being forced to watch a corporate video about employee retention on the district manager's laptop computer. Art had lost another couple of ingrates recently, and the consensus was that he was better off Though, try telling that to the odious and overpaid Dan Carling, to whom he reported each Wednesday. The morning seniors were heavily in tune with the day-to-day dramas of the restaurant staff, at least one of whom seemed delighted with their presence. Dicky was a senior in high school, had long hair almost down to his waist, and seemed physically ready for the professional wrestling circuit, an absolute tree. All right now. "'Who needs more to drink over here?' he asked them, touching each one on the shoulder as he flitted about. "'Mr. Dawson, no biscuit for you today?' "'Mrs. Rye, where's that dress you promised you were going to wear?' "'Hey, 
No colonel today? Where's the colonel? You tell him I'm going to come looking for him if he ain't here tomorrow. I was going to spend the rest of the evening writing to Roy Rogers' corporate about tripling his pay. I did get a little bored when I realized the only other thing anyone wanted to discuss was the ridiculous prices of everyday objects, including corn, carpeting, chickens, cold medicine, and anything at that awful fancy new Safeway on Route 11, where the pork loin you could get for three forty nine a pound at Food Lion was almost four ninety nine a pound. But thankfully, the lunch menu kicked in at 10.30 out here, and soon enough it was time to watch others wolf down big Montanas and curly fries. Wait, those might be Arby's things. So while I dined on ice water and whatever shards of lettuce happened to fall off the delivery truck outside when they brought in real food, before I knew it, we were saddling up and heading off to the slammer 15 miles away. We were only allowed to get as close as the visitor's parking lot of Dighton Penitentiary, which was plenty close enough for my taste. It was only a minimum security prison, but the redundancy of the layers of barbed wire around its miles and miles of fencing seemed to hint that they had half the cast of Last House on the left locked up in there. A frizzy-haired woman with a clipboard came out of a side building that kind of looked like the community swim center in my hometown and checked Davis's ID and told him that the guy who needed a ride would be out in a few minutes. Davis spent most of that time insisting to Carolyn that she was cold, despite her claims that she was just fine, thank you very much. She seemed a bit sleepy, though, and Davis promised her a nap, by four or so. Davis told me that their son lived in Minneapolis with his wife, and had the distinction of being on The Price is Right ten years ago, where he'd won the showcase showdown. You know they tax you on all that stuff? Every last thing, Davis told me. A set of snow tires that was part of the showcase still resided in their garage, in mint condition. They knew almost nothing about the prisoner they were driving to a halfway house in Whitman, but they'd been asked once to fill out a form specifying which levels of felon they didn't feel comfortable with in their passenger seat. They hadn't checked off any of the boxes. They were good for whoever. From the unimpressive door the woman had disappeared back into emerged John, a very big and very round fellow with a full gray beard. I got out of the car and said hello as he waddled over creakily and took my place, and I scooted next to Carolyn in the back. John just barely fit into the front seat with his big Ikea bag full of clothes. With John, Carolyn wasn't shy at all. She woke right up. Right off, she wanted to know everything about where John's childhood had taken place. John seemed not to mind. He'd grown up about 30 miles north in Orleans River, and his entire family were fisher folk. "'Oh, I know everything about fishing, that's for all sure,' he said. I totally had to ask him about the biggest fish he'd ever caught, expecting to hear a tale of a marlin as big as a futon or a mutant tuna that had nearly bitten him in two off Montauk. But it had been a twelve-pound sea trout in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm not entirely sure that's even average. John also listed for Carolyn all the churches he had attended since he was ten. There were a lot of them. He'd even helped out the pastor at Dighton from time to time. John's breathing wasn't so pristine as he strained against his seatbelt, and I felt like suggesting we pull over to buy him a Mr. Pibb or something. He seemed to be actually expanding in size, like a vacuum-sealed mattress that starts to burst out of the plastic when you cut just the right seam. John was looking forward to getting back to Orleans River in a year or so, and fishing every day and maybe mixing that up with a little masonry, which he was also good at. The address where we were dropping John off felt almost as remote as Causeway itself, and I wondered how John was supposed to make a living out there. The nearest small town was three miles away, no buses. The real surprise came when we pulled up the long circular driveway to the halfway house, whose worth, I would estimate, was three or four times greater than any of the other properties in the area. It was an actual mansion. It looked like one of those huge but slightly tacky places pro athletes buy because they're far enough out in the sticks to have crazy loud dwarf tossing parties. This was definitely a 10 acre whopper. John had discovered the secret to living the high life get busted for offenses unknown until you wind up with a cozy bedroom in the farmland celebrity district. We all shook his hand and wished him luck and made sure he had the $170 they'd given him at the prison, which Davis had told me was the standard payout to new freebirds. John was met at the door by a tall man of thirty or so in jeans and a tie. He smiled and waved to Davis, and the errand was finished. Everyone around here knows that house, Davis told me. 
Insurance millionaire donated it to the county, and he wound up in jail himself for fraud a few years back. His lover turned him in. His gay lover. Can you imagine? Yet another story I wanted to know. But Davis and Carolyn had places to go and people to see, and that was the end of my day of yearned-for roast beef sandwiches and those inclined toward a life on the sea. November 28th. Unfortunately, my third ride couldn't be the roller coaster of adventure that my first two were, but I was due to come back down to earth a bit. Noel was 17 years old, and so painfully shy that I had to immediately ditch on my plot to corrupt her into hanging out with me at the Bathtown Winter Fair just across the border of Nampa County. She was doing a little Sunday ferrying as part of a service requirement for her graduation that every senior had to slog through. She was nervous about driving her parents' humongous Jeep Cherokee, which she normally used only to get to her part-time job at the Hallmark store. I had to lean way over most of the time to hear what Noelle was saying. She had straight black hair, and her body had been swallowed by multiple sweaters. I actually was able to get Noelle talking about one particular subject. She wanted to write science fiction novels for a living, and seemed happy that I wanted to hear the details of one she was working on. It was about a peaceful planet settled by human pioneers who didn't suspect there was a kingdom of hostile aliens on the outer edge of their system. Only when the aliens discovered strange markings on some documents they'd unearthed, the English alphabet, did they realize that they needed a way to communicate in writing as well in order for their culture to survive, and they threatened the pioneers with annihilation if it wasn't taught to them. Noel's voice was so soft that I never quite nailed down the name of the book, which was something like bowling tall oranges. So it was just going to be me facing the hordes at the winter fair. Bathtown consisted of a four-block downtown area, ten or eleven blocks of old houses, and an outlying strip where Burger King and Track Auto kept capitalism strong and tasteful. When Noel dropped me off, the fair was in full swing and no one could park downtown. It was closed off entirely. There were two dozen or so big white vendor tents, A merry-go-round and a temporary stage where a young woman in a pom-pom hat was playing Tracy Chapman's fast car on an acoustic guitar, singing in a voice that was half beautiful and half terrified, or maybe just stifled by the bitter cold. Flush with the big bucks, I made some serious scores in those vendor tents. One of the best ones was run by the owner of the local Wiccan shop. Lots of strange-looking stones and incense and a couple of shelves of books with titles like The Good Witch's Book of Days, Dreaming the Dark, and Nighttime Grimoire. I picked up a book of spells, but it featured nothing more potent than one that raised your awareness of area wolves. I probably had an app for that, so I asked the owner if she had anything spicier stashed somewhere. She told me the good stuff was back at her house, and she tipped me a wink. This struck me as either a come-on or a genuine invitation to descend into the beckoning maelstrom of the dark arts, I felt it was best to pass on both, and I bought a bar of soap with what looked like M&Ms floating inside it. Bathtown had a comics shop, too, and a tent had been all set up to sell off what it could. It had been two decades since I had read a comic book, but I was elated to find that Jughead was still his crazy old self, dissecting life's conundrums as only he could. I did thumb a crumbling copy of an old issue of Tomb of Dracula, which I'd loved as a kid. The storyline of this one had Dracula taking a steamship to America and bumming a ride with some chick to South Dakota, where he tracks down an evil force that set up camp inside a mysterious mountain in Devil's Lake. When he goes in there, there's a gigantic bleeding heart inside, five stories tall. I would estimate the number of times I'd read that issue is between ten and five hundred, My original copy had gotten so worn that I still remember carefully applying a single, very long piece of scotch tape to the spine on a snowy day during Christmas vacation from school. It was that issue, I think, that I used to summon mail-order sea monkeys to my home using my hard-earned allowance. Were they a disappointment? Why, yes, yes, they were. Then there was the mysterious ceramic purple foot. It was in one of the artisan tents. As described above, the foot was purple and mysterious in nature, of ceramic origin. You could put something into the top of it, I supposed, but the recess was so deep that mentos or chuckles or circus peanuts would be irretrievable, and the foot's bottomlessness ruled flowers right out. So why, then, did the foot exist? 
What was it trying to say? I was afraid that asking would come off as insulting, so I decided to buy it and sort out its weirdness on my own time. But then I thought, what if Noelle never comes back for me? And what if I have to wander down the highway in search of a ride while the temperature plummets and I die of exposure inside an abandoned trolley and the police find me clutching a purple ceramic foot? These are the things I think about, along with wondering how airtight my alibi would really be at any given moment if some random person I knew suddenly disappeared. Having a brain is a miserable business. Flurries were beginning to fall. Before the cold drove me into the local diner for a four-egg omelet, I was given the extraordinary opportunity to close a circle of time. Flipping through some used DVDs in my last tent of the day, I came across a copy of Two Evil Eyes. My God, there it was crying out for my creepy embrace. This movie had been the focal point of a defining night in my life. It had been showing at the One Dollar Theater in Glen Burnie, Maryland, that fateful day when my friend Eric Knights, with whom I had watched every dubious flick Jumper Cinemas had ever offered, told me to meet him at the ticket booth on a foggy Friday night so we could recommence our bi-weekly study of Hollywood's lesser offerings. Jumper Cinemas was legendary. A bastion of frayed carpeting and broken hand dryers, a place where a young man could retreat from the crucible of late adolescence in order to wallow in badly scratched prints, twizzlers that had expired shortly after Orson Welles had wrapped the shooting of The Lady from Shanghai, and half-filled bottles of Corona rolling and rattling down the center aisle, their origin always unknown. I took the 18 bus up there with breathless anticipation. If history were any judge, there would likely even be pancakes at Denny's afterward. But Eric never showed. Little did I know that he'd gotten into a fender bender in his dad's station wagon, and it was undrivable. As showtime approached and passed, the prospect of watching two evil eyes all alone on a Friday night proved too pathetic even for me. So I got back on the 18, except I got so engrossed in my paperback copy of The Thornbirds that I never noticed the bus was heading north, not south. I was on the 18N. When I was next aware of my surroundings, I was pretty much in Baltimore, which, to a suburban high school doofus like me, was a guaranteed ticket to the morgue, courtesy of all the whizzing mortar rounds and roving bands of post-apocalyptic lobster people my parents had assured me were omnipresent. I finally got back to Crofton at 10.30, where I had to beg my mother via payphone for a ride the rest of the way home. I never let Eric forget that he had kept me from ever absorbing the cultural touchstone that was two evil eyes. A film so obviously immense in scope, yet so intensely personal and innovative that one could not truly understand cinema or life itself without having seen it, and seen it for one dollar. So here, finally, was my chance to end the saga of heartbreak, at triple the cost of that long-ago movie ticket, damn it. Did I care to change the narrative so drastically, tearing a hole in the very fabric of time and truth? I did. I watched the movie later that night, and oh how I hated my so-called friend Eric, because it was exactly as mediocre as promised. What would have been a true Jumpers-approved classic, right up there with Action Jackson and the Mothman prophecies. I could almost pinpoint the spots in the movie where the changing of the reels would have produced a delicious outbreak of blotches and loud staticky pops as the projector suffered a near meltdown, one of the hallmarks of the Jumpers' way. Carrying my DVD proudly across the street, I passed a man with shiny black hair holding a microphone, into which he would loudly tell a fairly bad joke, gesticulating broadly, then pass the mic to a woman next to him who relayed one of her own as a fairly large gathering chuckled politely. They went back and forth like that for some time, their cold breath visible in plumes. The man did get off a good one about the last several U.S. presidents walking into a bar, but the poor woman, not nearly the seasoned comedian he was, only got genuine laughter when she brought out the old chestnut about the two elderly priests who accidentally vacationed at a new beach. They didn't seem to mind that their material was falling flat most of the time. They were enjoying themselves. I learned later that she was the town treasurer, and he was the mayor. Bath town was awesome. The diner was a good way to close out the afternoon. My young waiter had developed an intriguing service technique centered around disappearing into the glow of his cell phone at every opportunity. At one point, I looked up and saw him slouching in a booth all the way across the room, texting away. He looked up, raised an inquisitive eyebrow, and pointed to my water glass. I shook my head, and he pumped his fist softly in the air as if to confirm the brilliant wordless success of our communication. 
Through the front windows, I watched a pigeon hop back and forth along the sidewalk across the street, as if it had been assigned to patrol it, either wildly indecisive about its next move or just totally meh on the concept of flight. There was a very bad moment, very, very, very bad, when Noelle was late picking me up and wasn't answering her cell. The badness was not that Causeway was going to send out an all-points bulletin or take away my nightly porridge for getting back late, but because the light in the sky was developing those terrible late winter Sunday colors, and I was all alone. The festival had shut down at four. Nothing was open for me to hang out in, and to make things easier on Noel, who wasn't familiar with the area, I'd selected a very prominent pickup point beside the local elementary school, where the quiet was positively torrential. I paced and paced as the light faded and the blues, reds, and oranges on the horizon became faint and muddled. I sang Rush's Red Barchetta to myself two or three times. I tried to play my alibi game in case I was picked up for the baffling disappearance of Bathtown's mayor. Mostly, I just announced aloud, This is not good. This is not good on any level. Over and over, sometimes trying on foreign accents to see how that went. Finally, Noel pulled up, looking impossibly tiny through the windshield of that huge gas guzzler, apologizing so profusely that I felt awful for her. She'd gotten hopelessly lost. I told her it was no big deal at all. I just had a thing with that kind of light in the sky at that very specific time of day on Sundays in particular, and now that I was in the car with her, I was cool as a fool. No biggie. I prodded her about her favorite comic books as we drove back to the world of comfort and plenty. She thought Dracula way too scary, but she was a fellow Jughead apologist going way back. That was Noelle. I couldn't wait for Strolling Ball Mortgage to come out so I could buy ten copies. December 5th Mark Cole was the remorseless villain who would prove to vanquish the athletic legend that I had embodied for every single one of the 42 years I had existed on Earth, minus the last 30 or so. I never did get the full story of exactly why he had volunteered to shuttle Causeway folk around on the occasional Sunday, but I suspect it had something to do with simple boredom. He pulled up in what was by far the crappiest car yet, a battered blue Sentra that sounded like it was choking on a Lipitor pill. The day was a total oddball, upper fifties, sunny and windless. My initial scheme to hit back-to-back -back history tours in Biddeford was dealt with a lethal blow when I judged Mark to be an outdoorsy fellow itching to engage in matters of sport. He showed up in a white t-shirt, gym shorts, sneakers, and a ball cap professing a preference for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. You know, the standard outfit for a man of 62, which was how old Mark was. He was tall and thin and had a hearty southern accent as well as a deep tan and heavily creased face that spoke of a life under the sun. He had, in fact, held more than 80 jobs in life by his last informal count, and was basically a real-life foghorn leghorn eking out a minimum-wage existence of manual labor just to keep a roof over his head come the cold winter and living with a succession of lonely women who would cook pork chops for him. Recently, he'd been a book sorter, laundry press operator, signpost digger, and crossing guard. At no point in Mark's life had he ever worked in a cubicle, or filled out 401k paperwork, or even been promoted that he could recall. When he got tired of a job, or the job got tired of him, he left with no hard feelings. In two days, he was going to start another new job, this time in the mailroom at a company that made helicopters, so he would see how that went. He liked the newly retired woman he was living with well enough, but she was getting fat, he said. What he really preferred was a Scarlett Johansson or Anne Hathaway or that woman from the show about serial killers. I didn't press him for specifics. He had never been out of the country. He knew a little sign language from working in a cafeteria at a school for the deaf, and he thought it might be fun to keep up learning it as a skill, but to Mark, the future was not something to be terribly concerned about, so whatever happened with that happened. He missed the South and was endlessly surprised at how rude Northerners were. We decided to play tennis. History tours could wait. There was something about Mark's skyless nature, his acceptance of whatever the day held, that made me feel 14. I bought us a couple of rackets and some bright new yellow balls, and we hit the courts at Guildhall Community College. That initial boisterous bounce of fresh Wilsons on the clay when they first sprung from the can was the only thing I really liked about the sport. After a gentle volley for serve, Mark, 
who could remember where he'd been when Kennedy was shot, tossed the ball into the air and thwacked it at me so hard and fast that I almost called 911. He proceeded over the next hour to destroy me, body and spirit, moving around the court with the ease of a dancer. He had no special talent, no fitness regimen. I realized eventually he had simply never stopped moving his limbs in life. Health food, gym memberships, Atkins diets, these he knew nothing about. But he had a lot of spare time on his hands and spent none of it with a book. He'd never owned a car. The Central belonged to his girlfriend and he walked everywhere. He had remained in shape while I, the spring chicken, almost as skinny as he was, had allowed my reflexes to atrophy so badly it was a wonder I could even tilt my wrist enough to see if it was time for another trip to Dunkin' Donuts. This despite the fact that one of the pillars of the Pelican program was constant exercise, and I'd been making an honest attempt to draw up plans for a push-up, which was sure to happen sometime in the spring, if I could secure the funding. After a grueling four official sets, the last three of which barely even registered because I was busy fighting off fatigue-induced hallucinations, I stumbled into a warm patch of grass and collapsed. Mark chuckled. Kind of nice day today, he said. You're real good. For lunch, we pulled over at a wide spot on a country road into a place called the Homestead Bounty, a buffet-style detonation of carbohydrates and general assault on the meat-based senses, an arena in which I felt I would normally have held the upper hand. Under traditional circumstances, few work a lunch buffet with the agility and strategic acumen that I can. If there were a magazine called Northeastern All-You-Can-Eater, my picture would surely grace the cover of its inaugural issue above the caption, the Prince of Pudding. But I behaved well, confining myself to the buffet six square inches of fruits and vegetables, while Mark's survival instincts kicked in nicely and he tore up plate after plate of whatever wasn't nailed down. Mark was the only verified orphan I'd ever met. He'd left his foster home at age 17 and had been at loose ends ever since. He told me the weird story of what had happened to his two foster brothers, Richard and Fred, down in Tennessee where they'd all grown up. After high school, the two of them had scraped together just enough money to jointly buy an ice cream truck. This endeavor went well enough, until one day, Richard's girlfriend of five years made a pass at Fred, and she proceeded to declare herself a free agent and switch teams in Fred's favor. Richard, a hot-tempered, occasionally knife-wielding gent, wished upon his foster brother a painful death by falling anvil, but wasn't willing to abandon the ice cream truck. So they kept working it, side by side, day by day, barely speaking. One day, the police had to come, because Fred took half a filled drum of Rocky Road and slammed it over Richard's head, at which point Richard stumbled around blindly in front of onlookers with an inglorious crown of ice cream stuck to his noggin. It became a local legend, how these brothers despised each other but kept hawking ice cream together. It finally came to an end, three years later, with another suitably thematic act of violence. Right in front of a group of neighborhood children, Richard threw a bottle of Hershey syrup at Fred and hurt his right eye so badly he had to have surgery. They drifted apart after that, but anyone growing up in Lebanon, Tennessee during those golden summers would immediately know the tale. Mark hadn't heard from either of them in 30 years. Their old ice cream truck had sat all that time in the weeds behind the town's sheriff's house, silently maintaining its legend. It was featured once as the August photo of a free local calendar the town council made. It needed no real explanation. I was really just tired after lunch, so I had Mark drop me off pretty early. He thanked me for the free meal and almost fell out of the car when I told him to go ahead and keep the tennis stuff. A rematch was scheduled for 20 years from that exact moment, which was the soonest it seemed like I might have a chance against him. As he drove away, I realized he had offered his hand for shaking five different times that day. When he introduced himself, when he dropped me off, when he destroyed me on the court, when we left the buffet, and when I made him a gift of the rackets. December 12th. I was starting to wonder if the number of people who had signed up for volunteer driving was in fact so vast that I would never simply experience a repeat. I imagined a shiny drilled regiment of drivers lining up for duty as every new dawn broke over Canlis each taking a solemn vow to commit seppuku after dropping me off at an RV show, so neither of us would ever suffer the indignity of seeing each other again. I was certainly enjoying this thrifty game of stranger roulette, 
But I wouldn't have minded learning a little more about Pete Pagny's attitudes towards, say, Martin Luther's publication in 1520 of On the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, or which swear words went best with a back-talking broad. And I didn't like the idea of losing touch with the gang at Roy Rogers, especially Kathy and Ed Fells, whom I chatted with very briefly just long enough for them to tell me they were both recovering alcoholics of 42-plus years, exactly as long as I'd been alive, and still didn't consider themselves free of the bottle. Not for a moment. But I was way off on the driver count. In fact, on the twelfth I had to be shepherded by none other than Barrett Boyle himself, benign administrator supreme. He swung by, on a day off no less, and picked me up in his cozy sedan, which of course he drove so serenely and courteously that he had to remind me every mile or so that I wasn't still asleep in my bed. My itinerary consisted of nothing more than catching a musical at the old State Theatre in Cross Lanes a local production of 1776, plus a Meet the Cast meet-up afterward. To my surprise, Barrett kind of wanted to see it, too. He and his wife had always been big fans of theater and musicals in general. So off we went, Barrett emitting calm and goodwill toward all on the road, with every politely timed turn signal. He had oldies radio turned down very low. A faint aroma of tobacco kept us company, too its origin being one of Barrett's misbehavior moments, as he called them. Mrs. Boyle wasn't doing so well these days. She had a number of ailments which kept her home and sometimes in the hospital. It's circulation, you know. That blood just doesn't want to get up and go, Barrett said. They'd even had to cancel their annual trip to see his sister in Boston. But so much immobility had turned her into an absolute demon at various online games and puzzles, and Barrett had bought her a second-hand iPad which she employed for one purpose and one purpose alone, playing against strangers on the web, whatever they felt like challenging her to. She would go for hours in her favorite chair, knocking people from St. Louis to Winnipeg off their high horses. At one point, as we drove, I wondered aloud why Barrett seemed to be headed past a seemingly obvious turn onto something called County Connector 9, which the map indicated took us directly toward cross lanes and went near a barbecue shack that Yelp assured me was not only open during the bleak midwinter, but open till six in a rural area where clocks had no real need to go that high on a Sunday evening. At the mention of the road, Barrett looked like he had seen a ghost. I've never heard of that road in my life, and I've lived around here eight years, he said. Okay, Mr. Guest, let's try that. I forgot to say, he called everyone at Causeway, Mr. or Mrs. Guest. County Connector 9 started off sort of wooded, then became pretty heavily wooded, then morphed into the type of wooded that Sam and Frodo probably had to deal with on their way to meet that giant freaky spider. The shoulderless country road got thinner and thinner until it became entirely unpaved. We bumped along at 20 miles per hour for five minutes, then 10 and just as I was about to check the map on my phone, it became unpaved and one lane only. Great big rocks and potholes in the frozen ground threatened to swallow us up. Barrett had to rotate the steering wheel constantly in tiny jerks and freakouts like that fake way they do it in the movies. Oh, we're going to need someone up there looking after us today, he remarked pleasantly. County Connector 9 went on and on. No one came the other way, thank God. There were no houses, no signs of life. If the car had broken down, then I would have been forced to eat Barrett immediately to survive. Time spun out. Eventually, a small wooden sign emerged up ahead, low to the ground, its status as a state-approved guidepost somewhat disputable, as all it said in hand-painted blue block letters on a white background was, Paradise, with an arrow pointing to the right, where another narrow shoot of hot certain death split off the one we were currently condemned to. Paradise, Barrett. I cried. And you went right past it. Oh my, that is some real craziness is what that is, he said mildly, damning us to eternal torment by motoring ever onward. There are those who would probably claim that paradise was just the name of a farm or something. Don't believe those haters. I've had a sense about these things ever since the age of six, when I spotted the real Santa Claus walking out of the Red Lobster at Westview Mall, kind of weaving a little. County Connector 9 finally ended at a T, and the last stretch of road to the barbecue shack was just as Kathy and Heathcliffy. Two more white-knuckle miles later, we were spat out into an open field. The farmland around us rolled up and down in all directions with almost Welsh splendor, 
and we had been delivered safely to eastbound barbecue, which was nothing but a smoker on wheels and a couple of picnic tables surrounded by pastoral glory with a winery off in the distance. Even as we ordered our food, we could see people tramping towards us over hill and over dale, not much more than overgrown dots in the distance. The only other customers at the moment were a family of four, the father sipping hot chocolate from a styrofoam cup and griping about the cold. Baird and I both got chicken plates and agreed we had never smelled anything that good in our lives. 1776 at the somewhat crumbling State Theater in Cross Lanes. Turned out to be pretty good, too, when we finally got there. The theater was about half full. Opening night had almost sold out, and the next weekend's performances would close out the five-show run. The show was dominated by the lead, which was played by one of those outsized personalities who likely got all the company's biggest parts, from Puss in Boots to Inherit the Wind to A Short History of Nampa County. I shook his hand at the meet-and-greet as he nibbled on a huge piece of the stage manager's 50th birthday cake. The actor was the drama teacher at the nearby middle school. Oh, I used to live in the city, too he said when I told him where I was from. Little by little, it kept pricing me further out, five miles at a time, until I wound up in cross lanes. Now I'm slowly, slowly working my way back. I was wondering about the girl who had played Abigail Adams. She spent the entire hour after the performance sitting very still in a chair in the corner with her eyes closed, breathing softly and evenly. Sarah had a horrible flu on Friday night and just as bad last night, the actor told me. I bet she can't even move to go home. Such dedication. She overheard this and opened her left eye, just her left, and raised her hand to give him a thumbs up, like a football player being carted off the field. Then she faded again. The cast in general was an unusually talkative bunch, probably quite excited to be mixing with the public. I complimented one of the minor players on his performance, a kid of 18. Since he was 12 years old, he'd spent every summer traveling with a Renaissance festival, learning from his father the art of juggling knives and swallowing fire. He was due to graduate in June, and the week after that he would begin touring full-time on his own with several circuses, beginning in Chicago, followed by Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, and New Brunswick, Ontario. He practiced at least 12 hours a week, and he showed me his most recent scar, right at his eyebrow, where he'd burned himself. At 16, he'd fallen off a giant rubber ball as he juggled and fell right on one of his knives and pulled it out of his hip in front of a crowd of 500 people. His father said he was getting close to a total mastery of his craft, and he expected never to have another accident again. I asked him if he was worried about getting bored at some point without the possibility of going up in flames or falling off the rubber ball down an elevator shaft or something, and he told me he sure was which is why he studied so hard. He'd only gotten two B's since he got to high school. He wanted to go to college eventually and become a statistician. Driving back to Causeway, I asked Barrett about his very first job out of high school, dishwasher, which had actually lasted almost 10 years, and about if he had thought much about retirement. Oh, I don't think I'll do that anytime soon, he said. Missy and I still like to help our kids out with money sometimes, you know, even though they're on their own. It's so surprising, you know, how you never stop wanting to help them. You'll find out sometime. I couldn't believe the day was over already. I had an unexpected burst of energy after Barrett dropped me off, and usually when this happened, it led me directly to YouTube. Coincidentally, I had been ordered by the State Theater's box office supervisor to check out the infamous clip of the Cross Lanes Players 2009 production of A Master Builder, which had been videotaped by the lead actress's brother, who cannily recognized the guaranteed viralness of what he had in the can. During one early scene, a background player had looked out and seen that his ex-girlfriend was in the audience with her new boyfriend. In accordance with the messiness of the breakup, she displayed her middle finger to the actor from her seat, and the camera watched him openly respond in kind on stage just seconds before he stepped forward to deliver a line. The best part was the comment section below the embedded video player where the star-crossed lovers had engaged in a profane war of words that forced other commenters to pick a side in the conflict and stick with it. What Barrett had said about me finding out about kids, I sort of had already. For a time, I had been with a woman who had a little girl of five, so for quite a while, there had been all the requisite piggyback rides, explorations of the outer reaches of Candyland, and 
shady deals to push through the consumption of leafy vegetables. But that had been a couple of years ago now, and I didn't really know them anymore. December 19th My time at Causeway was coming to a close, and so much of the countryside had yet to be explored. If I was to effectively map it for the brave Portuguese explorers, who would certainly follow at the inevitable request of Queen Maria, I would have to compress a lot of experience into a very short time frame. Before I knew it, I was slated for my last Sunday excursion. This was Hanalor. I knew I was in for a fun ride when I heard the cure coming from the car's speakers as it pulled up, horn tooting. Hanalor had black hair with deep blue highlights and a modest tongue ring, and she knew all the good late-night arty dives in the city, even though she didn't live anywhere near it. She was a student at Glassboro, midway through her master's degree program. She intended to work for the state prison system when she finished up. She'd already notched 90 hours teaching creative writing and basic watercolor to folks up in Dighton. She had been dabbling in prison reform and dancing to German electronica for three years now, though rarely at the same time. She knew all about the 70s British punk scene and the steps of its migration over to the U.S. Her clothing was very stylish and edgy and carefully selected, and she drove like an up-out mad woman. Her words, not mine. Sorry, I drive like an up-out mad woman, she said. We were headed toward the Guildhall New Year's Fair, where there would be everything from loom demonstrations to Native American storytelling to face painting to a battle of the bands. Rabbit adoption was to begin promptly at noon. Over 100 rabbits were expected to have new homes by the time the smoke cleared. Now you. I really can't guess the reason why you're driving me on this frosty Sunday, I said. Yet I had, in fact, hazarded a secret wild hypothesis based on a vague hunch. And it turned out I was right. Hanlor had once been a patient at Causeway when she was in her teens, not that long ago at all and liked to stay in touch with the system and help out a little here and there, racking up college credit where convenient. Becoming a prison therapist was not entirely out of the question. First of all, she said, you may think you want to go to this fair thing, but what you really want to do is go to this concert my friend Michael is hosting. I perked up instantly. What kind of concert? Why did I say concert? It's more of a dance thing, actually, she said. It's at Art Space North, kind of near me in Bathtown. Just a few hours of music and a bunch of people throwing themselves off the walls. You'd love it. Trust me. And I'm supposed to bring as many people as I can. So if we stop and pick up my friends Sharon and Paul, that's a carful. It makes me look good. I hesitated for about two seconds. True, I was still nursing several major spinal separations from my tragic tennis miscalculation with Mark. But I figured how hardcore could a Sunday afternoon dance party in Bathtown be? I was going to miss the loom demonstrations with every fiber of my binging, but maybe they'd show the highlights on Sports Center. Off we went. So if I wanted a second chance to score with the owner of Bathtown's Wiccan shop, it would have to be now. As we drove, I got Hanalor to spill the story of her life. I was all messed up from the time I was eight or so, she told me. My mother was chemically unbalanced, and my dad got full custody of me. She actually abducted me from elementary school once for four days. Freaky time. But I think I got her craziness. Thanks, Mom. I started cutting myself when I was 13, blah, blah, blah. I went to Causeway when I was 16, back when it didn't have any voluntary anything. It was all committal by strong suggestion. Semi-suicide try. I'm not even sure how serious I was about it. They were pretty pushy with the drugs back then, not like now, so I was a little woozy all the time, and that's what made me decide to run away. Not that they were being sinister or anything, but the drugs just turned me into two different people, and that was kind of hideous. I even had a name for the medicated me, Hannah Smog. So one day, I just sort of walked out in the middle of the night. My father was delighted to hear that I managed to accomplish that. I even left a note so they wouldn't think I'd been abducted. I really, really don't want to be cooped up anymore. That was what I said. About a total of ten words. That was my big adventure in life. I slept leaning against a daycare center for the first night, and then next day I was walking through the neighborhood near where I lived, and I saw someone had left a car running on the curb in front of a house, and I decided the thing to do was take it. I got in and putted away like I had everything right. No hurry. 
I developed a scheme by the time I got to the highway. I'd drive until I ran out of gas, and that's exactly where I'd start my new life. Because I only had 30 bucks in my pocket, and I wasn't about to put it in the gas tank of a stolen car. But the stupid thing was already down to an eighth of a tank. So I had to ditch the car and park in three leaves, which you should probably know of, right? The funny part was, this was only about six blocks from my father's office. I didn't have any friends or anything, so it was time to start thinking again about where I was going to spend the night. But then I smelled something really amazing. Blueberry muffins. I was passing the local art center, and I went inside, following the muffins. This woman was in a teeny tiny cafe, making them. A little glorified closet where the artists and residents and their students could come get coffee and such. I stood at the counter and said, Excuse me, I'm homeless, and... I wouldn't mind learning how to make muffins like that. Pretty good marketing, right? That was Mel. She had started the cafe only a few months before. She was amazing. She had me with a place to live for free in about six hours. And she gave me a job at a cafe. She immediately treated me like the co-owner. It was always, what should we have as a special tomorrow, Hanalore? What should we charge for a latte? What should we put on our t-shirts? So for a year, I lived almost inside of my father's office, and every couple of weeks I sent him letters telling him I was fine, I had a job I liked, and that when I felt like it, I would come home and go back to school. I just never told him where I was. I took the bus to Cabell when I needed to send letters so the postmark wouldn't tip him off that I was so close. And guess what? I was kind of fine. I was totally fascinated by the cafe and everything that went into the business, It was such a day-to-day thing that Mel was constantly trying to come up with ideas to try to keep it going, and it trickled down to me. She could literally lose her life savings at any moment, and we turned it into an us-against-the-world thing. Every day when I counted out the drawer, I would think that night about how much we were short of the goal and what we needed to do the next day to make up for it. I could tell her anything, and she found it all funny, which was phenomenal. She saw the funny side of everything. She didn't care what it was. It was the first time anyone had given me something I should really care about. I still had some serious emotional things I was fighting with, but the cooking and the baking alone probably saved me from wanting to play around with killing myself anymore. One day I was walking back to the house where I was staying and had another freak chance come for me. I saw that cruddy little car I'd stolen. It was parked in front of a doctor's office and this guy was helping his mother out of the passenger seat. She was elderly and didn't move very well at all, and I started crying my eyes out seeing that. I had stolen some guy's car when he probably needed it all the time to drive his sick mother around. Didn't even matter if they'd found it the next day, which, let's face it, they probably didn't. I went to see my father on the weekend, and I went back to live with him after that. This Mel sounded amazing, all right. Where was she now? She married kind of a trip. Moved to Maine. The cafe burned her out. That little cafe, the size of a closet. We keep in touch on Facebook. She's like, help me, Hanalore. I'm studying to get a real estate license. I don't even remember whose idea this was. So what's your deal? How'd you get to Causeway? Wow, I don't have a story that fancy, I said. No cutting, no stolen car rings, no muffin baking, not much of anything. Jeez. I just got sad. The old year-by-year slide, very comfortable, like the lazy river at the water park. Hanalore nodded. Yeah, we call that depression on the installment plan. He'll be fine, though. My sense is pretty good about these things. You just need a business that's teetering on the edge of bankruptcy to give you real focus. I like the sound of this. Over the years, I'd had a number of terrible business ideas. In fact, it was probably dumb of me to give all my money to Causeway instead of putting it into producing my line of velvet bowling slippers. Nobody likes renting those shoes. Am I right? The name Art Space North turned out to be an inside joke among Hanalore and her friends. It was really a place called The Angler's Grill, and it was a sports bar in central Bath Town that didn't quite rise to the level of skeezy. It was actually a little too clean for that. So what it reminded me of most was a bar attached to the Holiday Inn or something. The kind they feel they need to build just in case that guy who booked room 318 has a drinking problem. The Angler's Grill had lost its lease, and no one was using it in the interim before it became a pizza place. 
So in order to make a little money, the landlord was allowing day rentals to his daughter's friends. Thus, the Sunday afternoon dance party, which could not make use of the bar, but it did have a DJ. A young guy, amusing himself by wearing a loud red pinstripe suit, which almost broke the irony meter in a place like Bathtown. He was a regular guy, according to Hanelore's friends Paul and Sharon, who didn't seem to have any questions about why some old weirdo was in her passenger seat, so I assume she had told them in advance that she may or may not kidnap someone from Causeway that day. There were about 20 people or so in the Angler's Grill when we got there, and the music was pumping pretty loud from four huge speakers positioned in the corners of the main room. It turned out Tim, the DJ, was completely intimate with the noise laws in town and knew exactly, precisely, how high he could turn up the tunes and still be in full compliance. He'd even put yellow tape on his mixing board to mark the maximum volume levels. Where he really excelled, though, was getting his girlfriend Mo to donate her skills as a theater major to set up special lighting inside the bar, which was activated all at once as soon as eight or nine people had gotten on the dance floor, by which I mean the space cleared between the existing tables. Wow. What an effect. The room, which had possessed the visual allure of a locker room in a minor league soccer stadium, sprang to life in a melange of purple, red, green, and orange, like the best layering of jello you'd ever seen. We were suddenly in a dry speakeasy, with artsy and strangely well-behaved college kids dancing up a storm while a block away the Heritage Baptist Church was just letting parishioners out onto the street after second service. There was even a potluck of sorts. Almost everyone had been responsible for bringing something— And that something seemed to be very heavy on bottled water, Gatorade, and those nasty compacted fruit bars which I had recently developed a taste for. The group was ready to go all the way to five o'clock, at which point the man would lower the boom on them and drive everyone at spear point back to the bosom of decent society. Everyone at Roy Rogers had been at least twenty years older than me. Everyone at Angler's Grill was about twenty years younger. And man, guess who I felt more comfortable around— It turned out I was far more in my element chatting about why the world had been going to hell since they invented Mrs. Dash than I thought. The cover of the loud music did give me an out in case I really didn't want to talk to anyone at all, and I decided to let Hanelore socialize freely while I hung out by myself on a stool on an empty bar. I tapped my foot to the tunes most impressively. I thought I saw a familiar face across the room. It took me a few different angles to realize it was Abigail Adams from 1776 now fully recovered from the flu and sporting some badass dance moves. I knew that the thing I could do to absolutely guarantee my presence would be awkward all day was not to get out there and shake it a little, but moving my body onto the floor felt like scaling the south face of Annapurna. Dancing had always confounded my attempts to approach even the Richard Dreyfus level of coolness. It was one of those things. There was absolutely no reason not to do it, yet absolutely no reason to do it. Unlike heading into the ocean when the water is a bit nippy, I could never get used to dancing after a quick adjustment period. It remained an alien, invasive act to me no matter how I wiggled, flailed, and poked innocent bystanders in the spleen. My dancing itself had been described in the past as anything from not noticeably terrible to the management invites you to have a seat immediately, sir, where we will gladly bring you a complimentary ginger ale. I kept trying to psych myself up, waiting for just the right break in the music and the perfect screen of bodies that would render me invisible to the naked eye for the eleven minutes or so it would take me to find the beat. But the imaginary sign in the air that read, No Trespassing Loser, remained firmly in place. This was the first time I could remember no one getting in my face in a dancing optional situation and telling me that, no, it was not optional. I had to get out there. Where were the hordes of irritating hipsters trying to ruin my pleasant time of quiet and introspection? Was peer pressure just a myth perpetuated by the mainstream media? Hanelar swung into my bubble once in a while to check in and have a chat when she wasn't tearing up the dance floor. I was introduced to a few people, and we shouted at each other for a bit, me asking a few dumb probing questions about who knew whom before they were yanked back into the fray again. I eventually got a glimmer of hope. Hanelor told me that some people were hanging out in the next room playing Poker Face, and that I should check it out. I had never heard of Poker Face. Hanelor had to explain it to me, as we walked through a partition and into a side dining room, where the rabble who couldn't get a table near the bar in the Angler's Grill's heyday used to sit. The group was a splinter faction of the Glassboro College Theatre Department, actor types, who had trouble taking things very seriously. The point of Poker Face 
was to tell the group a story in ten minutes. It was strictly timed on a cell phone that had absolutely not a shred of truth in it. The winner was the person who told the best story the most convincingly. Kids today and the things they get up to. The poker face group numbered only five sitting loosely around a table and knocking back bottled water, pretzels, Red Bull, and finally a little Heineken someone had snuck in. I had actually begun to worry that the young artsy set in Bathtown was so viceless that I'd have to educate them in the ways of illegally copying car wash coupons and looking up the origin of dirty words on Wikipedia. They invited me to play straight off. God bless them. This was something I could actually accomplish. The first story was told by the skinniest girl I'd ever seen, and it was a pretty good one. Real creepy stuff. She asked everyone if they knew of the little old stone house in Elko, and they all nodded. Apparently it was a mysterious local landmark. And she told them that she had been there when the roof was torn off. She had been having a midnight picnic in the adjacent field with her boyfriend, and they'd heard something loud in the sky, then saw a big dark shape looming closer and closer. A tiny plane, a Cessna, with its lights totally out, was coming in overhead, weaving dangerously, headed right for the stone house. They stood gawking as it came in low and landed in the field and almost flipped, clipping the roof. They ran to the plane, but no one climbed out. They looked into the cockpit. No one there. They actually got into it. No one there. They started walking toward the road while calling the police, and when they turned back, the plane was moving again, taxiing in a loop on the grass, bouncing drunkenly. They ran toward it to try to see someone in the cockpit this time, but they never got a clear angle. The Cessna took off clumsily and flew off into the night. Again, just a dark shape, barely visible. Yikes. The third story was the clear winner. The guy who had been responsible for giving rides to anyone who didn't have one that day, Nicholas, told it. Not only did he not give the slightest indication that he didn't totally believe what he was saying, but what he said was so gleefully stupid that people were clutching their stomachs trying to stifle their giggles. He claimed that back during something called the Year of the Shining Cloud, he'd been a soldier of the King's Army in the war between the Arcticans and the Sagittarians for control of a place called Crisia. He even had all the names memorized and made them roll off his tongue flawlessly. The war had caused the fearsome ten-story dragon Nin to rise from beneath the earth, and the terrible monster rampaged homicidally toward the tiny village of Idian Glen. Brave Nicholas was in charge of diverting him off his path. All looked lost, until the two came face to face with Nin about to rain fire down upon the Idian Glenians, at which point Nicholas held up a single piece of bacon as a distraction. Nin was sufficiently mesmerized. So Nicholas started running with it, covering three miles, five, ten, waving the bacon around frantically, luring the dragon over the mountains towards a place called Light Pass. There he dropped the tempting slice. Light Pass was disposable because it was pretty much full of Mexicans. The jarring political incorrectness of the statement delivered with such deadpan honesty brought shameful tears of laughter. And curse of curses, I had to follow that story. Keeping it short seemed to be the only polite thing to do, so here is what I said, inventing frantically. I was walking through the city one day, and I got this sense I was being followed, but whenever I turned around there was nobody there. This happened two or three times. And at one point, I was cutting through an alley, and this time, when I turned, I happened to look down. There was a pair of blue sneakers about eight feet back, almost like someone had stepped right out of them and not noticed it. I thought, hmm, okay. Two blocks later, I turned again, and the sneakers were back. Now I have experienced a lot of strange things, but this was the topper. Obviously, the sneakers wanted something from me, so I kicked off my loafers and waited. They didn't move, so I went to them and slipped my feet in, even though they were a full size too big. And as soon as I was settled in, the shoes began to move under their own power, taking my legs with them. Reeboks, they were. I thought this was great. I was off on an adventure. The Reeboks took me down the block and then made me turn left, and we were headed toward the subway. At last, this is what I'd always wanted, a complete surrender of free will. Every path I would take from that point on would be dictated for me by the sneakers. Where would they take me? What new life was I in for? They guided me over to the fare machine where I bought a ticket and then on to the next train. They let me get nice and cozy there and I reached down to take the right one off because something was pinching me. I hadn't realized 
There was a small gold key in the sneaker's sole. I clasped it tight in my hand and got even more breathless with anticipation. A gold key. I had no intention of letting go of it for a second. The sneakers didn't move again until we'd reached the end of the line. They rushed me then, moving so fast I almost fell over, but it was because a commuter bus toward Audubon was just pulling out and we needed to get on it. They took me off the bus in Anver. I was starting to lose hope that the Reeboks were walking me to the harbor and a nice long carnival cruise. We walked one more mile, and they stopped me in front of a big industrial building. We were at the gates of the Reebok factory. Just at that moment, a pickup truck pulled up beside me and a guy jumped out. He was saying, I'm here, damn it, I'm here. He yanked the key out of my hand and looked down at the sneakers on my feet and said, Good God, I told you I was going to be a little late today. Can I be late once in my life without you totally freaking out? And he unlocked the gate. And it was time to make more shoes. Seven months after I left Causeway, I drove back to Canlis to get a copy of some records so I could at long last get my medical leave paperwork straightened away for the IRS. There was some weird tax thing that someone told me would come up because of my six-week stay. It was the end of July, and the landscape had such a different look to it that my program there already seemed like it had happened a lifetime ago. The sound of big riding lawnmowers seemed to be everywhere. I was even stuck for a while on the road behind a painfully slow car towing a speedboat. A lazy passenger kept his arm out the window, sunning it and turning it this way and that to catch the wind at the most pleasurable angle the whole time. I felt a little ashamed that I had to stop and check my phone for directions twice, even though I had recognized a lot of the roads from the rides I'd gotten from the volunteers. I even stopped in Bathtown for lunch. And who was the very first person I saw when I pulled my car into Causeway's main parking lot? Destiny dictated that it would be Barrett Boyle, of course. He was outside the wreck building, watering the plants with an old-fashioned metal can. He was wearing the same suit he had worn pretty much every day during the time of our acquaintance. Never a slave to fashion was Barrett. When I tooted my horn and pulled over, he raised a hand and smiled wide, though I wasn't sure at all that he even recognized me. Barrett would have offered the same happy welcome to a rampaging wild boar. "'How are you there, good sir?' he asked me. I didn't want to burst Barrett's bubble too much, but I did tell him that things were only so-so. I tried to go back to work after I left Causeway, and that had worked out for a little while, but then it didn't. I had enrolled in therapy in the city, not highfalutin progressive therapy like Causeway's. My salad days of being able to afford such forward-thinking action were over, and my doctor there had strongly suggested it was time to go the medication route, and I'd agreed after a phone chat with Mary Bell who'd taken me through the Pelican program back in wintertime. "'Well, Mr. Guest,' Barrett said, watering those plants with love. "'I know this isn't how anyone wants to spend their time, but you just keep living your life path by path, and it'll take you where you need to go. We'd sure be happy to see you once in a while if you get in your head to pay us another visit.' "'Thanks, Barrett,' I said. "'Hey, are the volunteers still driving people around on Sundays?' Well, Barrett explained, dabbing sweat off his forehead, it's been tough to keep folks on board, so for the last few months it's been mostly me doing the driving. Me and a very nice young girl, Noel. Did you ever meet her? Absolutely, I told him. He said her parents had urged her to keep volunteering after graduation, right through the end of summer. I was still waiting for my copy of Trolling Mall Corn Range. And how about Paradise? I asked him the true test of whether his memory had managed to store the grand adventure he and I had shared in search of good barbecue and local musical theater. Had he ever come across it again? I can't say that I have, he said. But I have to tell you, I did go onto the internet and look up just what that was. Should I tell you? Uh Uh-oh. Decision time. Did I really want the juicy truth, I wondered. Was any mystery in this world ever going to top it? What are the odds I was going to ever spot a sign on a country road reading Immortal Life, 50 feet ahead? I could see it was going to give Barrett a chuckle to tell me. So I let him. Thrift shop? I guessed wildly. Adult bookstore? No, no, he replied. It's a deli. A deli? Sure. Why not? One day... 
Barrett and I would surely eat giant sandwiches there, surrounded by rolling hills and quiet farms where shaved corned beef and giant kosher pickles grew wild and unafraid under a sky as perfect as God had ever created. There had been in the beginning, and there remains to this day, a vast bulletin board on one wall of Causeway's reception center. There's a notice on it that says this, Many of you may not have had the most shining memories of your time with us, but we have every intention of remembering you because you give our days their meaning. Before you leave us, we urge you to use these boards to post any photos you've taken that we can keep as a reminder of the friends we've made. I was never much on asking people to pose for photos, but I'd done it anyway, and over the course of those six weeks in winter, I'd managed to use my cell phone to snap every single one of the folks who'd driven me all over the country. So up those pictures went. I see now that I should have made copies for myself, so that in remembering them, they wouldn't slowly fade in my mind into something more like pencil sketches, with little details forgotten or confused. But I still feel real good about the photos being where they are. I like the idea that people might walk past the board and think to themselves, who is that guy standing beside the volunteers in all these vivid colored pictures? This tall, healthy looking guy with a big smile in every single one of them, looking more like the staff than one of the patients. And if I were close by, I could turn to them with a certain sneaking pride and say, That's me. That's me.